Psycon time! I'm so excited. Um, so we are on week seven. We are nearly at the end of our first series. Yeah. There are only two more episodes, I think. So, That's scary. Um, do you remember last week when we spoke about just sort of psychology? We I said do. it sort of inspired how looking at how sort of biological processes affected cognitive processes. Yeah. Well, this actually came to be a thing of its own. <laughs> you might know, like, it's when you like, it's what like neuroscience is really. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but this, what we're talking about is the biological approach to psychology or biopsych, uh, whatever you're. <laughs> whatever you want to call it, really, yeah. as long as it's got bio and psych in there somewhere. <laughs> and that is the study of the relationship between brain and behaviour. This is behaviour in its broadest sense, so it's not just how the brain makes your arm move, it's also how your brain makes you think about something randomly mm. throughout the day, how the or brain makes you ruminate. how your body makes you work out that you're hungry, or that yeah. you're full, things like that. Yeah, we do, yeah. Lots of things. Um, so yeah, one of the first questions to arise within biopsychology was um, the mind-body or, or mind-brain problem. Um, does the mind control the brain or is it the other way around? Um, that's actually a huge question <laughs> in psychology. That's something we get asked quite a lot and uh, yeah, we don't know. So I guess in <laughs> this sense, mind is sort of what most people would consider as consciousness. Like yeah. Does your experience of your mind make your brain do the biological things or does the biological things happening in your brain make make your mind happen yeah <laughs> or are they the same thing yeah or that i think that's the simpler way of looking at it um, and this is another one of those age-old questions that the greek philosophers tried to tackle um they had a couple of different approaches to the problem yeah so democritus proposed that everything in the world was made up of something called atomos um means indivisible uh, and it was his term for the smallest particle possible so that's kind of come true. <laughs> I wonder what that inspired. <laughs> <laughs> well done De Democritus. Um, but he also thought that the soul was also made up of, of these atomus um, and the soul uh, was inclusive of the mind, the mind was part of the soul um, and made up of atoms and so was a material object, it was something you could hold if you could locate it. Um, Plato, on the other hand, had a totally different idea. Yeah, so he advocated the dualistic approach, basically saying that the body was material, the brain was material, but the mind was something immature, immaterial and spiritual and a completely different um, entity, whilst Aristotle at the same sort of time advocated monism. And monism comes from the Greek word monism meaning alone, and that's the idea that the body and the mind consist of the same substance. So it's a bit like Democritus, it's a bit sort of like saying that they are the same thing. Um, but monism can be further divided. Um, there are some that are materialistic nominists. Monists. <laughs> there is materialistic monism, which is the belief that both the mind and body are physical. And there is idealist, idealistic monism, which is the idea that neither the brain or the body are physical and that both are non-physical. So I guess that's the idea that we're just spiritual entities. Bear oh, is that the grief. how do I know that I'm not dreaming kind of idea? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I don't really, I don't like that one. No. <laughs> I find it uncomfortable to think about. And then you have some writers, more modern ones, like Garrett, who argue that the mind doesn't exist at all. It's just another concept, like the weather used to describe related but not identical phenomena. Oh. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but the whole idea that fish aren't real. Because <laughs> there is no sort of genus or family in taxonomy called a fish. Like, what we describe as a the thing, the animals we describe as fish are too broad to be classified as the same thing. So yeah. we basically just call anything in the sea a fish that's got flippers and fins, but they can be as different from each other as like um, a human is to a crocodile. Oh. 
So in this I sort see, of sense, yeah. Garrett's arguing because the mind isn't one set of things. Like yeah. Loads of different things can all be described as the mind, and that can change depending on what mind you're describing. There's no such thing as a mind in itself. It's just a label that we've attached to, a, like an umbrella term for a really broad. So he would argue that maybe, for example, the um, lower biological function of like regulating heartbeat and stuff shouldn't be put in the same concept as higher thought processes like reasoning and decision, but because they're completely different entities, but we all class them as a mind. Yeah. Which makes them kind of meaningless. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the mind is a concept used to describe the summation of all the brain's many functions, but it's not anything independent of the brain because all it does is describes the brain's functions. Right. So Got that's it. a sort of logical... So it's kind of like the word for brain. The word brain refers to the combination of neurons and grey matter and white matter, whereas the term mind refers to the ability to speak and the things that you're seeing and basically all the things that the brain works out for you. Yeah, but yeah. because the brain is responsible for everything described by the mind, the mind isn't doesn't exist in of itself. Yeah. It depends on all the functions of the brain to be laid to, Got it. to exist as a concept. Okay. Cool. Um, so if we had fewer fish, then we wouldn't have any fish. Yes. Because you could classify them as the individual species. I wish I knew more about fish to give you some examples. <laughs> yeah, I about, know. <laughs> but like shark and rays are considered as fish, but yeah. they're a completely different um family to say a goldfish. Mm. Yeah. But we see them both as fish. Definitely. Um, but in contrast, dualist thinkers like Plato saw the minded brain as separate entities, um, that the brain is material and the mind is immaterial. Which I guess if you're arguing that the mind doesn't exist because it's just a concept. <laughs> <it's immaterial. laughs> Well, it's all, it's all a big argument anyway. Yes. I think that's what we can definitely pull from that, is everyone's got a different idea. Nothing has been resolved in the no. hundreds of years. <laughs> <laughs> not we personally, because we're not that old. <laughs> I would hope that would be self-evident, but I'm glad you made it clear. Um, it's common in science to use models um, to propose mechanisms for explaining how things work. Um, and these are often in the form of a theory. So you've got Darwin's theory of natural selection, um, or it can be uh, the study of a simple system or organism in an attempt to understand a more complex one. And this is something that biopsychology uses quite a lot. They study the absolute basics and then try to generalise that to more complex things. Like the appeals that we saw a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Exactly, because they've got such simple nervous systems, it's easy to work out exactly what's going on and then apply that to a more complicated system. It must be something similar sort of thing. One of the earliest examples of a biopsychological model comes from the French philosopher and physiologist René Descartes. Um, it's known as the hydraulic model and was influenced by his observations of statues in the royal gardens that moved due to a complex hydraulic mechanism when visitors stepped on certain tiles in the gardens, effectively robots. So he sort of sat there and watched how um, these statues have been manufactured to move by the movement of fluid and he reasoned that nerves were actually hollow tubes filled with fluid which he called animal spirits and these flowed from the brain and the sort of the flow would go in and expand the muscles and cause them to move and retract and cause them to um what is that word contract no no relax yeah yeah <laughs> um and what he thought was that these animal spirits sort of entered in through pores in the brain and then it was the penile glands that kind of collected them all and Dispersed, dispersed throughout the body, body yeah. and so he reasoned that the penal gland was the seat of the soul. Um, it's so a little bit exorcist. Yeah, <laughs> it is considered a dualistic approach because he sort of saw the body as a material, physical... Machine, almost. Machine, yeah. yeah. 
And then the animal spirits were this sort of immaterial fluid that whilst inflating a mechanical object also had this very sort of spiritual soul-like quality and obviously as it's entering through the pores it's nothing that you can sort of see or observe so mm. it's quite a, a dualistic approach but his attempt at physical mechanistic explanations for how behavior was controlled by the brain really did foreshadow the sort of physiological approach that followed and yeah the approach that biopsychology takes today which is working out the mechanisms of how things mm. happen because the sort of basics of his idea that the brain sends something mm. to the rest of the body to make something happen is true the yeah. brain sends an electric signal which tells the rest of the body how to move so the basics was there yeah and that's definitely the next sort of direction that it took some argue that the Renaissance gave birth to science. It encouraged thinkers to test their ideas through direct observation and experimental ma manipulation. Um, it led to empiricism and the practice of collecting information through observation rather than intuition or logic. And one of the sort of examples of this in reference to biopsychology, which is when we sort of first started uncovering the electrical potential of the brain, and this is quite a famous one, is in the late 1700s, the Italian physiologist Luigi Galvani did some very famous experiments with frog legs, and these were detached from a frog's body, and he was sort of stimulating them with electrical currents, and found that the legs twitched and moved, almost as if they were attached to a living body once again. And that was kind of what started the idea that we run on electricity, in an abstract kind of, well, not, not quite in the sense we have to plug ourselves in and charge ourselves up, but there's definitely electric electricity going on. Um, this is off the top of my head, so yeah. this might be incorrect. But I do believe that when it was first sort of being conceived that we were running on electricity, it was on static electricity? Yeah, I think so. Because a lot of the early experiments, so when we sort of discovered electricity and started working with it, it was with static and then it built up to a more powerful electric charge. Yeah. And it's actually some really, in, we're going to have to go into this again because there's loads of really interesting <laughs> experiments of people like just electrocuting a bird to see how many <laughs> volts it will take and then electrocuting a goose to see how many volts that will take. There was an instance where they electrocuted a little orphan boy that was hanging from oh the ceiling. Oh my god! There was a time when he electrocuted an uh, elephant, which is a, another quite famous one, but... Let's stick with the frog's legs. The time, <laughs> there were a lot of... We just found our new toy, it was like humans discovering fire again, and we were <laughs> definitely seeing what it could do. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> oh my god, nightmares. Um, we have already covered uh, Friction Hitzig in one of our earlier episodes, but they are pretty instrumental to biopsychology and how it was founded. So Fritsch and Hitzig in 1870 found that they could produce um, similar twitches as Galvani had found in frogs, um, but in dogs by stimulating specific parts of their brain. Um, and both of these studies showed that nerves operated through electricity rather than through the animal spirits that Descartes proposed. Um, so this was sort of accepted but not fully understood. Hermann von Helmont realised that nerves weren't acting in wires in the way that they were conducting this electrical current that was assumed to exist. Um, the way that he calculated it, the speed of conduction in nerves, which is about 90 feet per second, fell short of the speed of electricity through wires, which is estimated to be closer to the speed of light. And this opened up a huge sort of inquiry into how the nerves functioned in the brain and has really just inspired a lot of future research. He, Helm Holtz himself, did some work on vision and hearing and how the, the sort of biological mechanisms that underpin that. And some people, such as Fancher, who said this in 1979, said that Helmholtz gave psychologists their first clear idea of what a fully mechanistic mind might look like. So if you've ever studied psychology, you might have done, covered any sort of nerve function or anything where it's sort of like, oh, this hormone goes in and it activates this cell, which activates that cell, like that 
approach was inspired by Helmholtz, who was inspired by Galvani and Fritz and Hitz. Hitz. Sure.